this is a paper that I just recently wrote uh, for Appy Conference. It's called Teaching Tips, an Economic and Pedagog Pedagogical Defense of Gratuities. Um, I've been talking about tipping for a long time in a number of my undergraduate classes, and one of my students had said that that's about the only thing that gets me excited, or at least I get very excited when I talk about gratuities and tipping. And so he says, you should just sit down and write a paper about it. And I finally did and, and wanted to make this a, a paper and a presentation for folks, because I do have a lot of fun with it. And the first thing you have to do when you have a paper or any kind of project, you got to have some motivating questions here. And I have two major motivating questions for this study or for this talk. The first one of these is from the news in the last five years or so. There's been a movement by some kind of mid-tier to upper-tier restaurants, smaller boutique restaurants, to move away from a tipping model for their uh, wait staff and move toward a living wage model. So they don't require, they don't, they, in fact, they ask that you do not tip um, the servers and instead they pay a living wage of $15, $16, whatever they might want to do. So there's a, uh, in Seattle, there's one Ivers Clam House that actually um, moved in that direction as well. So that kind of motivated me to see what's going on. So the qu first question I have is the movement to a no gratuities in living wage model for restaurant servers an efficient model? Um, theoretically, I'm going to examine that question. There's been a little bit of empirical work done on it, but not very much. So I can see myself moving there empirically. Uh, the next question is an age-old question. If you're a rational choice theorist and you're going on the basic assumptions of microeconomic models, there's an interesting puzzle with tipping or gratuities. Why would people leave, to, uh, leave a tip at a restaurant that they know that they would never return to? Right? Because you're tipping at the end, and if you're a rational maximizer, why leave money on the table when you don't have to? You're, the menu uh, pricing says you pay $15 for your meal. Why give an additional $1.50 or $2? Why not just walk out and pocket that $2 in and of yourself? And a few uh, scholars have puzzled on this. Armin Alkian has asked this question, and uh, Milton Friedman have kind of puzzled about this thing. So I'll have some answers to that one as well. Any good talk that starts with some motivating questions, especially if it's an academic or scholarly talk, also should have some arguments up front. Uh, we're just at another graduate colloquium a few weeks ago, and one of the other faculty members had some very good advice to the, the graduate students and young scholars there. He says, when you're giving a talk, make sure that the people know the answer up front. This isn't a mystery novel where you want to fool them until the end. If anything, it's like Columbo, and if you've ever seen the television series Columbo, great social science because you see the murder, you, knew, you know who did it, and then from that point on, Columbo does the filling in the logic, which is a lot of how social science actually works here. So let me give you my central arguments that I intend to make through the course of the next 20, uh, 25 minutes or so. Um, main argument here is that I do believe that tipping is an efficient institution, and this gets people irritate because a lot of people I talk to say, I hate tipping. I never want to tip. I wish they'd get rid of tipping at restaurants and in taxi cabs and all these other places. It's really annoying. Why do they keep this thing around? Um, seems like it's not a very popular economic institution, yet it still persists. So we want to kind of figure out why it persists. I tend to think it's efficient, so I want to make the theoretical case that it is an efficient institution for the following reasons. The first being, it solves the principal agent problem. Principal agent problems are ubiquitous, and tipping is a par excellent example to convey to students that, uh, tip, that you can solve the principal agent problem in a rather creative manner. We'll get to that in a second. The next one is a little bit different, um, and I kind of step outside the box of traditional microeconomics here uh, and pricing theory, and my argument here is that tipping allows for voluntary price discrimination. And that's very beneficial to restaurant owners as well as other establishment owners that rely upon, in, in the service industry, that rely upon gratuities as a way to compensate their labor. And then finally, to answer that question, why would you tip at a restaurant you know you would never return to? This has been hinted at by other people. I think Milton Friedman is one of the ones who has hinted at this. Um, tipping provides a cultural institution um, that provides norms of trust in a society that actually fosters anonymous trade. 
Here I go a little bit more macro. It's not as a micro-oriented uh, type of analysis, but um, it's an interesting area of exploration, of scholarly exploration that I'm starting to dip my toes into. So we'll talk about that in a second. And then the other part of this talk, I said there's going to be an economic defense of gratuities, but also a pedagogical defense of gratuities. Over the years, I have found that um, talking about tips is a fun way to introduce students to a lot of economic concepts in ways that bring it home to them and say, oh yeah, I was at a restaurant. Should I have tipped or should I, shouldn't I have tipped? And you, they get confused on this, but they engage really quickly. Every, every class that I start talking about tipping, we can easily go on for three hours of nonstop conversation on tipping because so many people have different experiences from different parts of the world, have different examples, and it's a great way to teach a lot of these concepts. So if you're moving into the uh, pedagogical world of teaching, this uh, you might want to feel free to steal some of my ideas here. All right, let's first start off with the first part of the argument, principal age and problems. I'm sure many of you in the room uh, and to those of you listening on uh, YouTube, the live feed, uh, welcome. Um, principal age and problems are pretty simple. You have two people, a principal could think of it as an employer and an agent, a person who is an employee perhaps that don't have the same interest. They, they have similar interests in common, but their interests are different enough that the principal who gives a task to the agent, wants the agent to do something, but the agent has an incentive to perhaps shirk or do something different. And that causes a problem. How does the principal, the employer, make sure that the employee, the agent, is doing the things that the principal wants them to do? There's a lot of different ways you could think about solving these things, and this comes up in the restaurant industry quite a bit. So let's use the restaurant example here because it's where tipping or gratuities are most um, prevalent here in the United States. And you have two people here. You have a restaurant owner, which I'll have the, have the person in the chef hat here, and a hungry diner. And the restaurant owner wants to provide some great service to the restaurant uh, diner. The diner wants to have a great experience, and so those two are going to engage in some mutual exchange here. And if it's just the chef cooking for the, the, the diner, there's no problem here. The chef is going to cook the best food possible, have the best service possible, give that person the best experience so they have a nice time. They'll pay a little bit more. They'll come back in the future. They'll spread word of mouth. Uh, but the problem is, is that if you want to serve lots of people, you as the restaurant owner can't do it all by yourself. You're going to need to hire out other people, some cooks in the background, some or cooks back in the, uh, the kitchen, some dishwashers, as well as people who bring the food out and serve the people in the restaurant. So now you hire some wait staff people. Here you start to have a principal agent problem. The first principal agent problem exists between the chef and the wait staff, the waiter or waitress here. The chef wants, or the owner of the restaurant, wants to motivate the wait staff to give the best service possible because service is part of the overall restaurant experience. It's not only the food, but it's how you treat it and the ambiance and a few other things go into that as well. So they need to motivate pleasant experience. Now, we've probably all been to restaurants where we've had great experiences. I was just here at Hamilton's last night. Wonderful experience. And you've probably been at restaurants where the service is not too good. It just kind of ruins the overall experience. And you don't want to go back to that restaurant. Well, the, the owner doesn't want that to happen. They want to make sure that they motivate the wait staff to do the best job that they possibly can. Now, they could be monitoring the person and following them on the floor to make sure that they're treating the customers right. But that is a waste of their time. They might as well serve the customers then as well. So if the wait staff is out there outside of the view of the restaurant owner or the manager, how do you make sure that they're able to provide the best service? Well, if the wait staff knows that part of their compensation is based upon how well they serve the customer and the customer has some control over this, they have an incentive to exert a little bit better service at this point in time, which brings up the second principal agent problem here as well, is that you have a situation where the diner wants to have a really good experience, and they want to be able to motivate the server to come back and fill water glasses or to, to leave them alone, perhaps, to pick up a number of different cues. Because there's different types of diners in a restaurant. Some people are going to the theater. They want to get served really quick and get the bill and rush out. There are other people that want to have a nice romantic long dinner and not be bothered. 
There's other people like myself who like to sit around and chat with the staff saying, hey, what are the cool things to see around here? Tell me crazy things that have happened in the restaurant. So we all kind of demand different services here. So how do you motivate the, the staff to actually pick up on those cues and to serve, serve you for quality service? In terms of the, also in, in addition to this, there's an incentive to want to motivate future quality service. If you're a regular at a restaurant or a restaurant that is fairly near to you or a tavern, you want to tip pretty well or you want service uh, well in the future. If you call in, can I reserve this special table? They want to give that to you. So one of the ways to do this is says, hey, if you treat me well um, in the future, I'll make sure I take care of you now. In fact, I'll take care of you really now uh, take care of you very well right now with a 20% tip so you know in the future that when I come in, I'm pretty generous. So give me that extra pour of whiskey if you possibly could. So that helps to um, solve this principal agent problem between the diner and the wait staff as well. So it's mutually advantageous, this idea of tipping between the restaurant owner and also the diner to help motivate the server. Now, interestingly enough, it's also, and I make the case in the paper, it's also very useful for the server as well. And for the server, right, this is this is a difficult job. A lot of people think, well, you know, being a, a waitress or a waiter, that's not a, that's not a very difficult job. It's a low-skill job. But au contraire, you have to be able to pick up all these cues and things. And some people are very, very good at that. And the people who are good at that will get s signals market-based signals that say, hey, you're doing a really good job. You're picking up 20, 22, 25% tips because you do such a good job. Maybe this is where your skills should be allocated in the market. This is a great place for you. And for those who are not as good as that, um, they're only gonna get 10% or maybe 5%. Sometimes they might not even get any tips at all. And they might start saying to themselves, oh, wait a minute, why am I not getting any tips? Maybe I'm grouchy, maybe I'm, I'm slow and I'm not picking up on any of these cues from the service. Those people are gonna realize, this isn't for me. Maybe I should go employ my skills elsewhere. And overall, that actually helps to improve the restaurant industry because the people who don't have the skills to be good waiters or waitresses are the ones that leave the industry, leaving the good ones behind. And that's what I want, I go to any restaurant, I want the best quality wait staff there as possible. So it turns out that actually this is a win-win-win in terms of the principal agent problem here. It works out great for everybody. That's why it's a very, very good way to motivate um, individuals within this restaurant industry and benefits the owner, the diner, as well as the uh, wait staff. All right. You think about this principal agent problem, you start thinking about, well, we do tip at restaurants, but where else do we tip or where do we not tip? And so when I talk to my students, I say, think about it. Are there principal agent problems that we solve using tipping? Where might they be or might not be? Well, we just talked a lot about sit-down restaurants. It's pretty ubiquitous in the United States here that we use it there. Um, but not so much with McDonald's. Not so much of a principal agent problem. You go to McDonald's, it's a pretty simple transaction. I give you a couple bucks, you give me a Big Mac, it comes off the griddle, There's, I don't need a lot of service there. And it's pretty easy to monitor in a small area for the manager to know if you're doing well or not because you can see the lines and, and things like that. So Starbucks baristas for lattes, a lot of people tip there. Right? For future service, right? I have this seven uh, adjective drink that I have to make with special temperature. You know, I want to make sure that's done perfectly every time, right? So you give a buck uh, additional to each latte that you want, and they make sure that you have that special custom service to that. But what about if you just buy black coffee, just drip coffee? That's all you have to do is pour it and hand it over. There's not much special attention that needs to be done there. It's a very simple task, easy to monitor whether you're doing a good job. Now, some people do drop a few coins into the tip jar or tip box in front of the cash register. We'll talk about that in a second. But you typically don't tip as much there. Pizza delivery. I used to be a pizza deliverer. I understand that your future service is based upon how well you treat me the first time I meet you. If you give me a good tip, I will go out of my way to make sure that you get a great pizza on time. If you don't tip me so well, mm, that's not good because then I got to drive to your house and somebody else could be picking up a, another delivery to a person who is tipping pretty well. So I might accidentally tip your pizza on the way over or it might be a little bit slow. So always tip your pizza delivery driver. <laughs> but not garbage collectors. 
They come to your house every week, just like pizza delivery does, but you don't tip them. Well, because you can kind of figure out, well, the garbage hasn't been picked up, so they're not doing a very good job. Taxi rides. We tip on taxi rides quite a bit. And this creates an interesting problem related to why would you tip at a restaurant you know you never come back to? Because if you're visiting from out of town, it's unlikely you're ever going to see the taxi driver that you had. Why would you ever tip? That's an interesting question. The, the thing that came about over the past few years as I was talking about, somebody mentioned, well, Uber drivers, you don't tip Uber drivers. Although interestingly enough, I found half the people I talked to do tip Uber drivers with cash. They don't have the thing on the app to add the tip in until about two days ago. So I made this presentation about a week ago, and then Uber decided to actually tip. Um, I happen to think that I had something to do with it because I wrote a Fortune magazine article saying why Uber should allow for tipping of their drivers. And that was about a month ago, and now Uber is allowing tipping. So the impact that I have, right? I get things done. We'll talk about that maybe during the discussion. Hairstylist, right? You want good future service and the more bouffanty and big your hair is, the more you're likely to tip. But not Walmart employees. Now this is an interesting one because when I ask students, why do they tip at restaurants? The first thing is they say, well, we know that the, the wait staff is actually paid very poorly and we feel sorry for them. Well, you know what? Walmart floor employees are paid very poorly, and if you have to ask them, oh, where's the shampoo? I can't find it. It's, oh, aisle seven, sir. Why not give them a buck? They're paid poorly. You don't do that, though. Right? You don't tend to do that because there's not as much of a principal agent problem there. You could say, oh, yeah, they told me aisle seven. Oh, it's an aisle seven. They did a good job. Easy to, to figure that one out. Uh, and you don't run across them as much. You might not be expecting as much future service from those uh, folks as well. And oh, by the way, some waiters and waitresses actually get well above the minimum wage and pull down very, very nice salaries throughout the year. We have a friend who made $80,000 a year being a waiter at a restaurant. That's, that's good scratch. That's really good. Hotel housekeeping. You tip hotel housekeepers. Or do you? Um, I didn't know about this until a few years ago, actually a few months ago, about a year ago. Um, I never tipped the hotel housekeeping staff. How many people do tip hotel housekeeping staff? I'm just curious here. A few people. Other people don't. Other, the people without their hands raised saying, I feel pretty bad now. <laughs> well, we'll talk about why that might be the case or might not uh, be the case, especially if you're staying for several days or several weeks and you want an extra little bottle of shampoo put there so you can take it home, right? You want that. Um, or you want your, your uh, service done early in the morning so you can you know, work on a presentation in the afternoon or things like that. Um, Self-serve frozen yogurt shops. Do we tip there? They put out tip jars. And I've been seeing this more, and I say to myself, there's not a principal agent problem there, because all they do is weigh the yogurt and charge you. So what the heck is going on here? I think this is also related to why we tip a little bit for drip coffee. If your bill comes up to $5.87, you take the additional 13 cents. You don't want to carry it around much anymore, so you just drop it into a bin. And some of these self-serve yogurt shops now have these clever games saying, you know, who's the better person, Auburn or Alabama? You know, tip which one to fill it in. And so it creates kind of a contest. Do you want to give a little bit more? Here it says, who's better, Mark Sanchez or Tim Tebow? There's no money in either of those things, uh, which is kind of interesting. Okay, so that's the um, explanation that relies upon um, principal agent problems to explain why we tip and why we think it's, it's very efficient. It does solve a lot of principal agent problems in a very effective way that gives the customer control and also gives the principal or the owner uh, a great deal of incentivizing uh, features over their employees as well, and I think it's kind of neat. Here's the other one that's not talked about as much, and I'll be interested in getting your ideas on this. Self-selecting price discrimination and a lesson in gains from trade. In this picture, if you can see this picture, probably not on the live feed, but there's something really, really bad for a restaurant in this picture, and that is empty tables. There's an empty table right here, and there's an empty table right here. Since you have the space, you want to get it filled. If it's not being filled, that's a lot of dead weight loss. You're still paying rent on it. You're paying the, the waiter or the waitress to be there just in case anybody shows up. Um, so having unfilled tables is deadly, deadly for a restaurant. So how can they use tipping to solve this problem? Well, 
it relates to the concept of gains, for, uh, gains from trade. And this is a very important concept for undergraduate students to get because they often don't understand this. And I have found that once they understand what gains from trade really are, it unlocks the door to a lot of other economic insights and kind of chills them out on a number of different things. And this is the way that I present it. Maybe other people have presented it before, but in the past few years, I found this is fairly effective. You have dollar denominations here from zero dollars to lots of dollars here. And you have some customers. We'll call these restaurant customers. You have customers A, B, and C, who I'm going to call your mid-tier or upper-tier restaurant connoisseurs. They like going out for dinner quite a bit. And they have what we call a reserve or reservation buy price. When they go out to a restaurant like Hamilton's, they're willing to spend up X amount of dollars. It's not necessarily a specific point. It's kind of fuzzy, but they have an idea. I, when I go out for dinner tonight, I want to spend $80. Right? Nothing more than that. Um, some other people, they might not be as high end. This person might only want to spend $50. This person may be only $30. You're kind of low end people. So those are your reserve buy prices, the maximum amount you're willing to pay for the food, the ambiance, the experience, the service experience as well. Then you have the restaurant owner. The restaurant owner has a reserve or reservation sell price, and that's the minimum he's willing to engage and trade with you because the owner has to buy ingredients and flour and, and other different things, has to pay the mortgage, has to you know, heat the ovens so you need electricity, you have to um, pay your staff as well. So part of the reserve sell price, that uh, thing that factors into it, is the labor costs. And you want to try to keep these as low as possible because if you keep the, the reserve uh, sell price lower, you're able to capture more customers. You're able to capture more customers here. So the restaurant owner actually does have an incentive to keep the, the price pretty low. A lot of students think, no, restaurant owners just want to keep the price as high as possible and rip you off as much as they can, uh, which is this really kind of interesting thing that I have to disavow students. I always have a student who says, Starbucks always rips me off. I go, always rips you off? Yes, every day I go buy a latte for $4, and that's too much. And I go, well, why are you buying it? Right? And I say, how much is it worth to you? Well, it's, you know, I, I kind of force them to say, oh, my reserve buy price is actually probably $5. And I say, oh. And what about that day that you have to go you know, study for your final exam tomorrow and you need to stay awake? How much would you buy a cup of coffee for that? Oh, I'd pay 10 bucks for that. But Starbucks is only charging you three? Maybe you're ripping them off. Oh, the reactions I get from that. What? <laughs> because what we teach them about the gains from trade is that the difference between the reserve buy price of a, a customer and the reserve sell price of an owner of an establishment is the area where you can get gains from trade. So for here, for person A, they have a pretty high reserve buy price. They're only being asked uh, the reserve sell price here down for the owner. This area in here is the gains from trade. Right? Anywhere that anything is priced within here, um, you know, is gonna, some of it might accrue more to the owner, some of it might accrue more to the customer, but you can kind of negotiate that. Now, this area right here, when it comes to gratuities between the reserve sell price, and let's say that the restaurant owner actually prices his menu items and the whole experience at a menu price right there, and the reserve buy price, is the area that cu customer A could potentially tip. Wow, this was such a great experience. I had such a wonderful time. The food was fantastic. The, the, the service was impeccable. And so you go ahead and you know, throw in another 15%, maybe 25%. I, I tend to be a big, I like to think of myself as being a big tipper because I like to reward people for that. And I like going out to restaurants. And if I get great experience, I'm going to reward that. So this is the area where the gratuities come in here. So for person B, um, their reserve buy price isn't as high, so they're not going to tip as much. Person C, not so much. Person D is probably not going to be a big tipper, but they're going to show up because at least the reserve sell price, the price that the restaurant owner is going to be selling at, if it's the minimum price, is going to capture this person. They might only be 8%, but you know what? They're showing up. Maybe they're only 2%, but they're filling that table, and that could be Pretty good here. Person uh, E here, they're just priced out of the market. Um, they just can't afford it. You know, the experience, it's not worth it to them, so they're not going to show up here. So this is kind of area between each of the reserve buy prices and that is, is this kind of zone where you as a customer can voluntarily price discriminate. 
And the concept of price discrimination is trying to figure out how to price a item or an experience based upon how different people value it. And we, diff we all have different preferences for different types of service, different types of food and things. And it's with uh, unknown information, with information unknown about this stuff, it's difficult to figure out these people. What the tipping does is allow people to voluntarily do this, saying, oh, I really like service, so I'll throw in some extra money. So long that there's a norm existing in society that that is what you do to reward good service. To further explain this, what happens if we go to a no gratuities model and provide a living wage for the server. So what you're going to do is basically take the reserve sell price that the restaurant owner had before and price in a fixed amount for labor. So instead of allowing the customer to determine what the extra labor cost would be via the gratuity, now it's going to be priced in. We're gonna have the regular menu price plus 15%, that's going to be the, sometimes they put this the labor charge, the service charge, sometimes it's 18%, right? And so that's going to raise the actual price here and make it a fixed menu price. Now a menu price is just what we, in economics we call a fixed price, it works out well because we think of menus and restaurants here quite a bit. But this is the fixed price that anybody has to pay now. So it raises the, the reserve sell price of the owner quite a bit. Now, I, I'm just doing this so you can see it. It might only be a small amount that they raise it. It might be a bigger amount. This is just for illustrative purposes here. But here's what happens. That's kind of dangerous here. First thing that you notice is that price, customer D is actually priced out of the market. That's a table that will not be used. You know, person D used to come in every other week and fill a table. They weren't the best tippers, and maybe they could have gave that to somebody else who was tipping highly, but you know, at least they were filling the table. Now they're not showing up anymore because it's just too darn expensive to actually show up. Uh, person E is still priced out here. Um, person C right here, they're just right there at the, at the kind of limit. They're, the dot should actually be lying right on that line I, as I, I did it. It says the reserve sell price now is their reserve buy price. So they, they both kind of benefit from this thing. But any particular shock that could happen either way to the, perhaps the customer is worried about their job next week, their reserve buy price might drop a little bit because none of our reserve prices are actually fixed. They vary according to time and tastes and things like that. So they might drop down. The, you, the owner is kind of worried if this person, yeah, they're coming now, but what happens in the future? The other thing from the other side is that if service becomes variable, if service gets worse at the restaurant, that person's reserve uh, buy price is going to drop and they're probably not going to show up. And so that, that's a very precarious situation here. Some of the other things that uh, you can observe from this table here as well is that now each, menu, uh, each person at the restaurant only has to pay this price here where the red line is. Uh, customer A gets a lot from the gains from trade because they would pay much more, but they're not paying as much as they used to. They, oh, okay, that works out pretty good. They get more of the gains from trade. They get to keep it instead of dishing it out to the server where they might have in the, the, the gratuity models here. And so from the, I, from the end of the server, there's a benefit here, right, that your wages go up. So, you know, waiters and waitresses go, yay, I got a living wage now. So that kind of goes up. That's a benefit to you. The wage gain from the staff is the difference between the green line and the red line here. But there's also potential losses because customer A may have been throwing more money your way in the past. You, you got an 18% fee, and that goes to you for the labor. They might have been tipping 25%. And if there's a lot of people like this, and if you're very good at serving people and getting 25% gratuity from them, you actually lose out in this here. So it might be a net loss to you, depending on how many customer A and customer B types that you have out there. So that becomes a problem. But the big problem is that you start to lose some of these customers, and what happens? You can see more empty tables. And that's very dangerous. And this is why I think restaurant owners are fairly reluctant to move to the no gratuities model because it will leave people without, uh, or it might potentially uh, leave people out of the market, uh, price them out of the market uh, there. And that could be somewhat dangerous. The no gratuities model of service, I think, has some big problems. And I'm very 
skeptical of uh, restaurants moving to it. I think restaurants, especially more low-end restaurants, are very skeptical of moving to it for the following reasons, and some of these we've already covered here. First of all, it eliminates voluntary price discrimination. You pay what's on the bill. Is your 18% service fee? Okay, I can walk out there. Really wanted to give 25%, but now I'm told 18% is fine. Could you add that under the table? Yeah, you possibly could. But when it's told that it's a fixed price, okay, that's what I pay. That's what I walk out. Okay, eliminates that aspect of it. It potentially shrinks the customer base. We saw customer D priced out of the market there, and potentially customer C precariously balanced there at the reserve sell price, their reserve buy price and reserve sell price are right there. Any little shock to the system will eliminate them as a customer. Complicates the principal agent problem now. And now, and this is when I talk to my students, they go, well, every waiter and waitress really tries hard. You know, why would this affect them? Because, you know, people aren't motivated by incentives. That's my undergraduate students. You know, really? Um, I used to work in the service industry, and I know that if I came to work with a headache sometimes, a little hangover and stuff, I might not give as much good service. I mean, especially if it's a really annoying table. Oh, I really wish those people would go away. Hey, please go away. And so you still bring them their food, but you don't fill up their water glasses as much, or if you, you, they're not so worried about getting the correct order or having some cheerful banter, if they want to talk to you, say, like, listen, I don't got time. I got to go out to the back for a smoke, you know? And it's hard for the, the managers to actually kind of police that, um, that. So it also, the no gratuity model takes away the principal agent problem. And I would argue that it's going to reduce the marginal quality of service. And people that I've talked to who've seen some of these restaurants move in that direction anecdotally say, yeah, the service gets a little bit worse. Not, not horrendously bad, but it's a little bit worse, just a little bit, enough to cause uh, some problems. Um, on top of this, it reduces signals to poor quality servers, right? If everybody's getting the same 18% added on as part of the living wage, they're not you know, like, I'm getting paid as much as the same person next to me. They're a really bad server. They're kind of grouchy. Why do I have to extend a little bit extra effort, right? I, uh. And so your service tends to go down a little bit. If you're a good server, you kind of get irritated that that really bad waiter is not is making as much as I am. I'm better. Why should I'll just shirk a little bit more? And overall, the 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 quality of um, um, Service at restaurants tends to go down, right? The interesting thing, no, and, and poor quality servers actually still stay in the, the industry. And so for me as a consumer, if everybody goes to this model, I can see that on average, you're gonna have less good service in the uh, restaurant industry. Interestingly enough, this no gratuities model has only been used at small, higher end, you know, kind of medium, high to high end restaurants where they already have mechanisms to self-select in a lot of the wait staff. They've picked, the, they've picked the, the best cherries off the tree early on because it's a great place to work. They can interview them. They've had experience before. They have a track record of people who've, who've come in here. So that's, that's kind of interesting that many of these restaurants are arguing for that. I'm almost wondering, this is just a, a cynical, conspiratorial suspicion that I have that might be some kind of rent-seeking on the, the part of these restaurants, that if they move more of these restaurants toward a lower tipping model, it's going to eliminate some of the, the lower-end restaurants, some of, you know, like your Olive Gardens or Denny's or other places like that, leaving them potentially with more business. So I don't know. It's kind of interesting that it's only used, and also smaller restaurants where it's easier to monitor the wait staff. Not, there's not you know, 100 tables, there's only 10 or 15. It's kind of interesting to observe that. I haven't done a study on that. Anybody interested in doing that? You're fair game to do that or contact me. And then finally, I said, what's up with Uber? They're not allowing tipping until two days ago. So that's <laughs> they finally listened to me and they say, Uber, you should tip, but they're tipping now. So good for them. One thing I want to say about the... Um, uh, no gratuities models. Try not to be a libertarian jackass about teaching this stuff to other individuals. Uh, in the uh, city of Seattle, we went up to a $15 minimum wage, or we're on our way up there. And it's become popular amongst some of the uh, libertarian class to actually carry around this little um, card and not tip the wait staff here. It says, why I don't tip in Seattle? Economics 101. I'm going to teach you this you know, waitress or waiter here. As the compensation for your service increase, there's a cost to me, blah, blah, blah. So I'm not leaving a tip, screw you. 
you don't teach people econ that way. Okay, so that's um, one of the things that I, I do believe that tipping is a great way to be gracious, it's gratuities, uh, to individuals. And if you want to teach people, you want to engage them, you want them to like you first, um, rather than just saying, ha, you're screwed, you ha, ha, ha. Because they're never going to come over to you know, our side where we think the free market should dictate more of this kind of stuff than this kind of thing. So be very careful when teaching, um, as I found. This is one of the reasons why. I actually use tipping as a way to introduce uh, lots of economic concepts before I even get into stuff about minimum wage and other things where people get pretty hot-tempered about that, which leads me to my final argument here. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It doesn't lead me to my final argument. I have one more left. This is the, the question here. Um, why would anybody leave a tip at a restaurant they know they're never going to go to? I just made a case that gratuities are great for solving the principal agent problem and for restaurant owners and a few other service providers to fill up the tables or the hairstylist chairs. Um, but it's an odd institution because the customer doesn't tip until the end of the meal. And if you're a rational self maximizer that's only interested in your self interest, why not just leave? I'll pay the menu price and I'll just leave. I'm not gonna leave 15% or 20%, I'll just get up and walk away. I'm not required to do it, so why should I do it? Right? You walk away and that kind of thing. It's a tough question to answer. It really hits hard at those kind of basic um, assumptions about the self-interested, rational actor um, that, we, that microeconomics often kind of supposes that we are. So why would I leave a tip at a restaurant that I know I never would return to? Well, here's my argument for this. We live in a pretty big market. A world market, maybe people talking about globalization stuff. And we know that Adam Smith kind of gave us the recipe for economic growth and development early on. He says, what do you want to do is specialize, because you come better at things. You use resources more efficiently. And when you specialize things, though, you have to trade with other people. And so specialization and trade is really kind of determined by the extent of the market. So if you really want to be good at trade and specialization, you need to have a very expansive market. But when you expand the market, you start to expand it into people that you don't know as well. They're anonymous. I didn't know anybody's at Hamilton's last night. First time I've ever seen any of those individuals. Can I trust them to give me good service? We're, we're going to engage in gains from trade. Maybe they're going to rip me off. Should I trust them? I'm worried about this because they're anonymous to me. I hope other people have vouched for them on travel or trip advisor or things like that. So, uh, but uh, I don't know. Can I trust them? Well, anonymous trade does require trust. So how in society can we foster this? And this is where I start to escape a little bit more to the macro. I think what's going on macro is that we somehow as a society understand that we need to build trust in society to have efficient operating markets. And so we create a number of rituals that allow us to examine whether people are trustworthy or not. So we have these normative rituals, or rituals based on norms for trust building. Tipping is one of them. Imagine if you were out with a client that you want to do business with, and you go to a lunch, you don't know this person very well, and they skip out on the tip. They said, oh, I'll pay for it, and they pay what the, the cost was, and they don't leave a tip, and they left. You sit and you go, hmm, I wonder <laughs> if that person can be trusted in the future. Maybe they won't go out of their way for me if I need a little bit of help at, at a certain point in time. I don't know if I want to do business with them or another form of business, dates. If you go out on a date and you don't leave a big tip on that first date, you won't have a second date. And I know from experience, right? That's not a good thing to actually do. Actually, my, one of my, a date that I went out, I actually pulled on a discount coupon um, to, to pay the, the, the waiter with, and that was, that was bad. Never saw that that gal again, but that's good. Um, so we have a lot of other different things that we do. Tipping is one of them, but we have other things such as gift giving. Why do we give gifts? And usually when I'm teaching this subject, it leads to this very interesting discussion too in class that, it, again, for teaching, it fosters this other thing. Why do we give gifts at Christmas and birthdays and other events rather than giving cash? Because if you're a true rational economic maximizer, cash is more fungible. But we give gifts, oftentimes gifts that other people don't like, those ugly kitten sweaters that you, know, you get and you never wear again, but you say, oh, thank you very much. 
it seems like that would have a lot of disutility for it, but I make the argument is that when we do these sacrifices, burnt offerings, they used to call them in the Old Testament, um, when you make these burnt offerings, you're telling people that, listen, I'm willing to expend some resources. I'm willing to give something of me because maybe somewhere in the future, I might need something from you. Maybe even if we never meet again and your parents and your peers tell you, you know, in order for us as a society to cling together and to, to build trust and to make markets work, we all need to do that. Even though you'll never see anybody again, treat them well. I'm a, I'm a big aficionado of the Old West and there was a cowboy code. Uh, you had a lot of itinerant people that would come and go throughout the West. They were traveling back and forth. You never knew anybody. But there was a code that you always tipped your hat to a stranger. Um, you never looked back. You filled whiskeys to the, to the very top of the brim if you were sharing whiskey with somebody else. Right? These are all kind of signals that say, I trust you, you trust me. We might never meet again, but as a society, I think we are much better off. It's one of the answers that Milton Friedman I think in the book, Free to Choose kind of hinted at, and it really needs to be fleshed out a little bit more, and I'm trying to do that in my own work here. The question is, how do such norms originate and change? Remember I talked about, do you tip at a rest, uh, hotel? I never knew that until I was in Boston, and they had one of these envelopes out. It says, the envelope, please, and it says, your room attendant is, you know, so-and-so. Matilda was here to clean up your room or something like this. And it, the envelope, you know, it wasn't there to mail them a nice letter. You know, throw in four or five bucks or something like that. And I realized, oh, okay, they're trying to basically signal to other individuals that it's okay to tip here. So if more people tip, they can keep their labor costs down. They can make it look more like a restaurant, which helps them to, again, leverage the principal agent problems in ways that gives better service for everybody overall. But it's a, it's, if you're a game theorist, it tends to be an assurance game where you need to kind of shift the equilibrium. Most people are thinking you don't have to tip. Some people do. We want everybody to do that, so let's create a signal that tells us how to do that. The big danger with Uber when they were going to the no tip thing and taxi drivers were well aware of this, that if Uber doesn't accept tips, what if people got into their cabs, especially younger people who are not familiar with the norm, say, well, I don't tip people when they give me a ride and the taxi cab driver doesn't get a tip. Not surprisingly, they were on the side of a number of Uber drivers lobbying to get Uber to put in tips there because they could see the equilibrium in the assurance game shifting in another direction. How do these things operate? One of the great things that I have, and we have a number of people from other countries here as well. I have students from all over the place. Some places don't tip, right? And they're really kind of confused when they come to the United States. What do you mean tipping? That's kind of odd and strange. Why would I want to do that kind of thing? So you get into these discussions about this. And it also allows me to introduce the concept of uh, uh, the, um, the Outside Observer in Adam Smith's The Theory of Moral Sentiments, a book that I really love. I tend, in terms of human nature, I tend to be much more of a Smithian theory of moral sentiments than an Ayn Rand type of individual that oftentimes gets me in trouble in certain audiences. Um, but you know, Smith says, you know, in the back of our head, we have this outside observer looking at a situation, says, how would you like to be treated if you were in that situation? If you treat somebody poorly, that impartial observer says, that's not really good. You should kind of feel bad about that. And I think the cultural norms that we have um, and enhance that and keep these norms alive in, in many ways. And I think a, a lot of interesting empirical and theoretical work could be done on that. The other thing that I draw upon is James Buchanan. Uh, and I love his book, In the Limits of Liberty. He has this term he calls ordered anarchy, that most of our life is not governed by formal rules, despite the fact that us political scientists and economists oftentimes focus on those written rules, the regulations and laws that are written by legislatures and city councils. We tend to focus on it. But Buchanan says, you know, if you really look at life, most of our life is organized by these informal norms. And if these informal norms start to break down, that ordered anarchy becomes disordered anarchy, and it's just not really good. Conflict arises, and when conflict arises, people start to call for more written rules, more law and order. And that can become very dangerous. So I've become, in many years, a, a partisan of, of governance via informal norms and, and social codes, or etiquette, as he calls it, um, or manners, as he sometimes calls it. So interesting work being done there. Final note on teaching tips. 
Again, um, I've studied religion a lot. That's where most of my previous work has been done, and I've seen that missionaries uh, for a cause are usually best, not when they throw things in people's faces like formal models and, and all those things, but introduce, find ways that connect with individuals, things, experiences that they have, work with them on those dimensions to explain a variety of different concepts that they want to share with them, and then build from that. Um, rather than coming full on, as my pastor once said, you can tell the new Christian that they just got converted because they run around from door to door with the Bible and when knock on the door and when somebody opens, they go, Jesus! And then everybody goes, ah! And Jesus kind of scares people sometimes. Right? And, so, and I think that's true with some of us political economists that love liberty. You come into people and say, liberty! You know, we should get rid of the minimum wage. It's horrible. You come in and burn and go, ah! You're such a horrible person that you don't want to talk to you anymore. But if you give them an example, and this is just one I think, you know, with tipping, there's many other ways you can, things you can do. An example where you show them, okay, this is how it works with tipping, and oh, by the way, this is how, you know, gains from trade occur. You person who's buying Starbucks every day, you're actually getting more value. You might be ripping off the, oh, they go, oh, yeah. You know, personal life in a non-threatening way. And then they start to rethink issues about the minimum wage because this graph right here I use this in the next class or the class thereafter to basically say, okay, now let's think about the minimum wage here and how this affects the gains from trade and whether people are going to, you know, come to the store and whether the restaurant owner is going to employ these uh, waiters and waitresses in the future and stuff like that. You already have them in the door, and I think that can be actually very effective. Um, I think we have a great cause here for the case of freedom and free markets and liberty. Um, so the way we present it to other individuals becomes very important. So for all of you who are young scholars and graduate students and going on to a, a career where you're going to either teach in a classroom or teach people via your articles and books that you write, um, think about the ways to sell it, to soft sell these concepts to people that bring them in and make it really live to themselves as well. And with that, I will leave it to any questions and comments and gratuities that you have. Thank you. I love this. Tips, they're like hugs without the awkward body contact. I'm not a big hugger. I just have to share this example. We gave a, we were at Old Miss in Oxford. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This was in um, uh, Tuscaloosa. We gave a tip to somebody as a, uh, over a 20% tip on our bill, and the, the waitress came back and hugged my wife. She was so appreciative of it. And there was a restaurant that I visited at Chapman University last year, and we gave a very nice tip. We came back this year to the same restaurant. I hadn't been there for 364 days. The waitress remembered me, and, and they gave us a spectacular experience. So um, hopefully you enjoyed this presentation. I welcome your questions and comments. So I just want to start with um, okay. uh, we play the devil's advocate for a moment. Okay. I hate tipping. Uh, I didn't realize you were in Europe. Great. <laughs> Yeah. Uncertainty and things like that I find mm -hmm. But so in this, it seems that um, with rational choice analyses of these types of things, the norm exists. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I'm going to find a, a number of reasons why it, it's rational. Right. But that's not really my my question. Is um, you know, how do you, do you think that maybe looking at the history of of of, of, of how tipping arose in the mm -hmm. U.S. Versus why there is an absence of tipping in most Western European countries and even in Eastern Europe countries I've been in. Uh, I, I would like to see, see see this sort of flush. I think it's great, yeah. but but I think have you looked at sort of fleshing it out? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in the process of doing that. So let me ask, you have three observations there. I'm going to work my way backwards. The history of it is really interesting. Um, there is one academic paper on the history of tipping that is based on a book that a, I got like a pop cultural anthropologist has written on tipping, um, Seagrave. Uh, a wonder, I think Carrie Seagrave. Wonderful book. It's really interesting. Um, the history is kind of murky. It dates back to the late medieval period, primarily in Britain, as a way to compensate valets. Uh, and the, the informal thing is to ensure prompt service, right? It's the, and, that seems kind of a colloquium way we come up with the word tips. I don't know if it's true or not. Nobody really does. You start to see it mentioned more in the 1600s and 1700s. It makes its way over to the United States. And I don't, 
I just had these extra charts back here, but this is a, a chart of where they tip. Uh, and, and so if you go to Europe, you need to print out this card for yourself because it'll help uh, alleviate uncertainty. Uh, but it says, you know, here for restaurants in the United States, it's usually 15 to 18%. In Canada, it's same too. It's interesting if you look at these places, uh, Brazil has some tipping, but most of the places where Britain has been influenced. So India, there's also a 15 to 18% tipping norm. Australia as well. China does not have one. You have to get closer and read these. They, they just pick out certain countries. Egypt, I, I think it's like a 5%. There's some British influence there. So you can in, you know, see in terms of where this thing goes, I think it's a great study. Anybody who has um, you know, some scholarly interest in this, tracking down the history of tipping or trying to explain the variance of maybe where British colonies went or something like that would be a fascinating study. And we, I think we need to absolutely do that kind of thing to flesh out this problem uh, more in terms of this. In terms of your question that, um, you know, could this possibly be ex post facto reasoning? Yeah, I think it could, right? You have some kind of quirky behavior and you ex post facto reason backwards uh, to that. You know, Gary Becker, who you know, takes econ into a lot of different areas, is kind of susceptible to those kind of things. I've worked in the, the realm of the economics of religion and, you know, people say you're just ex post facto reasoning. Yeah. Possibly, but there might be an interesting story here, so put it on the table, and are there different hypotheses and implications that we can draw that would try to minim uh, minimize or mitigate that ex post facto? So I ain't done with this yet, so still working on it. And then the last thing with, that you mentioned about the ease, or your unease with tipping. Do I tip here? Do I not tip here? You know, again, print out this card. It helps a lot. It's interesting. In Seattle, we get a lot of um, tourists from... Um, Korea and from China and other places where tipping is not the norm. And in the touristy restaurants, there's clear communication say, hi, if you're visiting, please know that, you know, we add or, you know, we typically give 15 or 18 percent. Oh, here's a little tip chart or you go on your iPhone to figure out what the, the tipping is to mitigate the uncertainty. So the uncertainty is still there. Um, cultural institutions, I think, help solve some problems. Uh, I never say solve, actually. I take that back. Cultural institutions help to mitigate problems. They never solve them entirely. So, but interesting observations there. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I just have uh, two questions. So one, uh, at some restaurants when you go to, if you go with a certain size of a party, so if you go with, say, eight people, the tipping, it says we are all automatically adding a 20% tip. I was wondering if you could yeah. talk about that, how that fits in uh, your framework. Uh, also, sort of, I guess, building off what Dr. Salerno said with the history, Something I've noticed is that, at least when I talk with, uh, it seems like tipping back in the day, so when I talk with my grandparents, it was sort of like you get a tip when you do a really good job. Mm -hmm. So it's like the tip is, is not just for like a regular effort, like, okay, the waitress or waiter brought my food or the bartender got me my drink. It's like they really went above and beyond, so it's like, you know, A plus kind of. And... That's why I feel, especially sort of with, with, uh, with you know, I'm going out to with my grandparents or older people, they sometimes can be stingier with tipping because it's like, oh, they just did a regular job. They didn't, they didn't do like above and beyond. Whereas, you know, especially with younger people or say with my parents, it's like, oh, okay, you know, just you know, they, they did, they did what they were supposed to do, so they get the tip, you mm -hmm. know, like the standard tip. I don't know if that's built in somewhere where culturally over time tipping became less of a you know, you did a really great job to, okay, you didn't, you know, spin my food or it didn't take 20 minutes to get my, yeah. to get my meal. I don't know if that has factored anything into the history of what is the right line. Excellent question. I, I kind of foreshadowed some of your concern over that with the um, self-serve yogurt stand that has the tipping jar. I mean, whiskey, tango, foxtrot there, right? The first time I saw that says, you didn't do anything for me. Let me explain the principal agent problem to you. You know, I did. I threw in like extra change that, you know, there was like 15 cents and okay, I wrote it in there. Um, but yeah, these things, you know, creep over time. The norms change, right? There's, it's, there's potential research that could be done here on how these norms spread and get stretched and expand to different things, right? It first was maybe only 5%, then it got up to 10. I used to, I was in, inculcated into belief that it was 15%, but it's now it's typically 18 to maybe 20%. That might be technology. It's just easier now with an iPhone to calculate 18% tip, right? Whereas previously, you know, in some states, the, the, Tax was, you know, 8%, so you just double the tax, 
right, as a quick rule of thumb. But as things start to get more complicated, um, you know, techn technological shifts could stretch our use of the norm. I don't know. That's a potential hypothesis to investigate. Um, does it apply in other areas? We used to give A's to students in classes when they did a good job. Boy, do we give a lot of A's now, don't they? They're all super smart now, right? They're just uh, the, something in the water, I think, or something. So, you know, again, that, you know, we see this in our own teaching behavior, how we've changed over. I'm, I've been at this game now 23, 24 years at the University of Washington. So I've, I've noticed I've changed things. How does that do it? It's kind of self-reflective. In terms of that, great study. You want to study some of that? Contact me. We'll, we'll do some work on that because I think that's a, an area where more people could uh, be writing and researching and that kind of stuff. As for large parties, you just made my case that, that how wonderful this is as a pedagogical tool because most students do that. Say, so, yeah, when I, whenever I go out with all my teenage friends and there's 10 of us, you know, they always you know, put the tip on. What's the deal? I go, well, let's talk collective action problems. Right? Um, you know, 10, 10 people you're trying to solve, and everybody can say, well, I'll just, you know, my friend next to me will give a little bit more, so I can give a little bit less. Right? So you see a little bit of self interested behavior there. It might just be miscommunications or misinformation. You're not sure what you actually paid and how much you owe and that kind of thing. And I know uh, from of working in a restaurant, whenever we saw teenagers come in, more than four teenagers, you automatically threw that tip on there. And you warned them in advance that that's going to happen because otherwise no waitress or waiter wanted to take that table because you knew that teenagers would not tip very well. And then if word gets around that says, oh, you know, nobody's serving the teens, well, you lose the teens clientele. So you kind of, it's, it's a, for me, it's a, it's a um, pathway to talking about collective action problems, which is really kind of cool. Another, another hour on that stuff for the students. Other questions? Yeah. Yes, sir. From the point of view of the users, the investments, and I was trying to figure out if this is sort of the only. But so the bigger to that is sort of like a, a, a public good thing and decisions you're wasting, and like commission. Um, so in terms of the public good sort of going off, with, um, uh, that would have to be saying, if you have a big group where like you you served by several servers, right? Mm -hmm. Then the tip goes to all of them, or you share that, right? So the individual signals that you're arguing. Get much weaker, right? If you share it between all the staff or the staff doing that table. So, like from a consumer point of view, the table doesn't reach and it gets weaker. Mm -hmm. um, so, for the efficiency rate here, it's like the same problem with the efficiency rate here and the equivalent amount um, is that it only works if nobody else is doing it. Insofar as if everybody expects me to tip 15% and I don't tip 15%, then I don't get the benefits that you're saying, extra service or whatever. Right? I always have to tip at least 15%. To get extra service, I now have to tip 18. Mm -hmm. And when everybody's giving money, I have to tip 25 to get the extra uh, benefit, right? So it only works if nobody else is doing it. Third question, the commission. If this is true for the physical agent relation, why are we not using wage contracts that are basically only commission for uh, uh, wages? Excellent questions. Let me take those in reverse. For commissions, uh, you know, I hadn't really thought about this until you just mentioned it now, but yeah, you know, commissions are another way of solving that principal agent problem for realtors and for car dealers and things where, um, you know, they're selling kind of big kind of things like that. Some, um, you know, Nordstrom's I think uses commissions. Why couldn't we do this in a restaurant? I'm not sure. That's a great question to investigate. My initial thing, um, my initial reaction would be that, okay, let's, let's imagine a world where we do commissions at a restaurant and I bring in 10, uh, you know, wait staff members and we have a um, hundred tables. Let's say make the math easy. Well, obviously everybody should kind of do, um, you know, 10 tables on average. Well, who's going to get the first table? There's going to be some conflict over that. Maybe we could create a rotating thing based upon seniority that, you know, I've been around the longest, so the first person that comes in gets that table. But then, you know, as different people come in, there's different types of customers. And, and trust me, I, I've talked to a lot of waiters, waitresses. I've, you know, my own personal experience. You know when somebody comes in, there's a higher propensity they're going to be a bad tipper, right? Uh, you don't want that table. 
So you're not going to take that table. You want somebody else to take that table. But they know that too, so they're not going to want to take that table. So it creates a lot of conflict amongst the servers and could potentially lower the ambiance of the place because all the wait staff are arguing in the back whether or not they're going to take you because people in cowboy hats don't tip for, you know, right? Uh, and then I kind of then they go, so, you know, the, the idea is that you divide a restaurant up into 10 zones, right? You know, to A, B, C, D, and, you know, you get table A5 tonight and things like this. And then they try to seat, you know, the, the maitre d' tries to seat the people evenly. So everybody kind of eats the wait staff. Does. So it might be that. I don't know. That's one possible hypothesis worth investigating. The efficiency wage um, theory tip creep. It only works if other people are doing it. Is a brilliant thing, which might help to explain, you know, why are tips getting higher, right? Does that it used to be five percent? Well, if everybody does five percent, then it's just kind of ac expected. So how am I going to guarantee future service? Well, I need to go to eight percent, and then somebody says, well, I need to go to ten percent, and you know, I'm up, I'm up to you know twenty twenty five percent at my tavern where I get really good service, right? So maybe I'm forcing other people to come up to me. Um, it, it's interesting because so many people just automatically assume 15% irrespective of the quality of service. Um, I think the incentive or the signal is not so much to reward the good service, but to punish really bad service. That you don't leave a tip at all if the service is really bad. So I think the mechanism works in reverse. You're expecting 15%, but you might only get 10 or nothing. Um, and there's actually, I don't know how many people know this, I've, I've learned this stuff, I've been studying this over the past year or so. When you go to a tavern and you get a beer, the, the typical norm is to leave a dollar if you get a beer, even if it's a three or four dollar beer, you leave a dollar. Uh, and that provides really poor signal if you're always just automatically doing it without thinking. But there's this thing, you take an additional penny, you put it heads up if you thought the service was good or tails, uh, tails up if you thought it was bad. To communicate. So there's this additional signal I didn't know. And some of the uh, bartenders I know had to tell me about that. I thought, that's kind of interesting, right? So yeah, another interesting uh, way to explore this kind of stuff. Uh, the public goods thing, um, how, what was the public goods? For me, when you mentioned public goods, my mind went to the cultural norm, yeah. right? Because that's the real public good here. And, and for me to, you know, I, I still haven't wrapped my brain. How do we create these kind of cultural norms that help to spur trust in a society that relies upon anonymous trade? There is a big collective action problem there, public goods problem. How do we do this? I, I don't know. I'm still kind of foggy on that. Um, but is that, is that what you meant by that? My question was much more seated in a restaurant where you have different waiters waiting at your table. So you have three or four waiters waiting at your table. Like they're all helping out. And then, so I'm, oh, like, the yes. Exactly how they distribute um, tips in the U.S. Yeah. So right around, they distribute tips evenly across those uh, stuff. It's like everybody. Yeah. Uh, everybody's working to get equal share of the tips. I want to do a study on this, and this suggests a really nice empirical study because some restaurants, um, all the the wait staff pools their tips into a big fishbowl at the end of the night and they divide them equally. My, the implications there is that the service should be crappier there. If you get to keep, you know, you become the sole residual claimant of what you work on that table, the service will be much better. So there's a hypothesis that we could eventually go out and test and ask it. Interestingly enough, some places actually take their tips and share them with the, the busboys and the cooks and things like that. Um, I know this because my son has uh, a paid internship at the Duval Tavern um, right now. And he came home one night and he's, he gets paid because of Washington wage laws, he gets paid a higher wage than he's worth. I've told him that. Um, uh, and it's like, Dad, he goes, eventually you'll get there, but you've been working there for two weeks. You're kind of a clod, uh, but a lovable one. I love you, son, if you're watching. Um, he's, he's a good kid. Uh, but he says, oh, I got, you know, I came back with $50 in tips uh, this week. I'm like, what? You go back, go back and give those back to the wait staff and bartenders. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of thought about this. Is I'm, I'm wondering if there's some tip sharing that goes on as a way of solving a principal agent problem between the serving staff and the cooks, right? Because especially if it's a pretty busy restaurant, uh, you want the cook to be pleased with you because you say, oh, I, I got a rush order. I need to get these out for these people that are on their way to the theater. Could you quit make those hamburgers really good, right? You need to have that 
cook on your side. Because if they didn't like you, they say, <laughs> I'm going to screw you over. And they, they take a long time to do that. But if, if you share your tips with them and say, oh, yeah, you know, Tony is, is really good to me at the end of the night, I'll, I'll, I'll quick move this order up in the queue, right? I, I, potential ideas there. But he, see, again, the, the beautiful pedagogical aspect of this, it leads to so many different questions. You can start hypothesizing. You can say, okay, let's do an empirical study on this. I think it could be done. All right, thank you, folks. I'll, I'll stick around for any additional questions or anything like that. So appreciate it.